So some of you who've been through design education might groan because I say I'm going to start with a question. Because uh, we learn in design by constantly asking questions. So here's the question. Do you remember that feeling when you finally realised what you want to be when you grew up? Huh? Not me. I had to actually grow up before I knew that. And hopefully, I'm not quite so cheesy about it either. Because Steve Jobs said, you can't look forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. Having said that, he went on to say, I was lucky. I found out what I love to do early in life. Well, I was lucky too, but I found out what I love to do not so early. And I do love Christmas. So two weeks today until Christmas Day, can you believe that? And under this beautiful tree from Design in Action, from Design in Action, boxes. And boxes are always been a big part of my life. Always been big for me. So whenever as a child I received a gift, I'd pick it up, I'd shake it, I'd even... tear off the wrapping paper. I might even look what was inside. And you know, I'd look in the box and I'd even play with whatever was inside for a while. But by the Queen's speech, that's early afternoon of Christmas Day, I was thinking, what could I make from the box? Because I made dispensing machines from cardboard cereal packets, egg boxes, toilet roll tubes, product boxes, sticky tape. And these machines, they sorted coins from one another by slots and slides, with one of two results. Either you got a returned coin, or you got a fruit pastel, generally dispensed through an old toilet roll tube. So it didn't always work, but it didn't matter because sometimes it did. And it was the making that I enjoyed. After all, the coins were already mine and the sweeties were already mine as well. Anyone fancy a sweetie? Pass them round. Because there were no home computers, there were no game consoles back then. And I'm still reminded by my sister Angela that this was the kind of result if I lost at a board game. But in my teens, inside one of those gift boxes was one of these. Anyone know where it is? <laughs> ZX81 home computer. And it allowed me to design my own games and software. And I found that I loved coding. I even got my first A grade in art with animating with this. But when I left school, that was my departure from art and design, because I'd not yet connected the dot that by designing on that, on, on a screen, I'd become destined back then not for design, but for the ge generic field of computing, the dark non-arts. And computing was said to be the future back then, which was lucky for me, because I found that I love coding. And I ended up here from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every Monday at Manchester Poly being sponsored for a BSc in applied computing whilst working for a defence contractor, and spent the other days low-level coding for flight simulators at military bases around the UK. And it brought fiscal rewards. So at 21, I owned a property, a car in the village on the edge of the Peak District National Park. And that's interesting in terms of my current research. So let's skip forward a couple of decades so that I can explain that research. I'm now here at Edinburgh College of Art, University of Edinburgh. I tutor there part-time with the undergrads, masters, lifelong learning, graphic design courses. And I've got a scholarship for a PhD by practice using these spangly golden sheets that you can see around the room as well. So let me explain more. For the study of travel the United Kingdom, visiting eight art and design institutions, and at each I asked to work individually with five of the final year graphic design undergrads. So I visited Belfast School of Art, Camberwell College of Art in London, Cardiff School of Art and Design, Falmouth University, Gray's School of Art in Aberdeen here in Scotland, London College of Communications, Manchester School of Art, and Sheffield Hallam. And at each place there, I conducted 30 to 40 minute recorded sessions 37 times. Now that sample doesn't allow me to say anything about the individual institutions, 
but it does provide a solid qualitative sample of final year UK graphic design undergraduates. And the students were incredibly engaged and productive in what I asked them to do. So what did I ask them to do? Well, I gave each student a survival blanket. They come packaged like that, but they end up more like that. And the type uh, that are put around runners at the end of marathons. And each of them's about two by one and a half meters. And they use Sharpie Magnum markers with 15 millimeter nibs to visualize their answers to my questions whilst explaining what they were drawing. And you can see about a fifth of the artifacts from the research on the walls here today. And they really did come up with astounding stuff. So what did I ask them? Well, I asked them about ed education. I asked them to visualize their graphics education. Here's a classic viewpoint. Education with its ups, downs, and routines on the left, then a, def a definite division from real world and its earning potential. They related the highs here. Someone talked about learning from peers, peers and others. And the lows. This is about getting some great tutor feedback, quickly followed by not being able to get a placement. Uh, he described it actually in terms of a nuclear explosion. Um, and surprises. Someone went from an open vessel to a closed square in their education. I did question it, but she held firm. Um, then I asked them to put professional concerns aside entirely to focus on personal hopes and ambitions not related to work. And that resulted in a lot of clouds and fog. Um, but they weren't dark clouds or toxic smog, but rather a sense of anticipation what's on the other side. They were often thought to be simply too many variables for them to answer. And that's interesting because I wasn't asking for a commitment for a path through life, just what do you want outside of your work? And this person actually did go on to talk profoundly about meaning in the end. Some people provided the look of success, so you see there, you might just make out. Someone said, being able to go home to a roof over your head and put your feet up. And this house roof was consistently one that should be owned by the student as well. So then we did focus on profession. What emerged from this was a good sense from students of their own professional inventories. I'm tapas, not a Sunday dinner. It's quite insightful by someone. Um, this one says, the idea of not living creatively scares me. And they were emotionally intelligent in how they might react to this transition. So here you can see them accepting that they're going to go through a whole range of emotions in this next period of their life. And they acknowledge their need for acclaim and non-monetary reward. But looking at industry elaborated both education and profession more, I asked them how they visualized this term that we use so much in creative education. And I asked them to name the industry that they were in. Um, and actually many people were really metaphorical in the responses there. So this industry is called the Watchers. It's a UFO spaceship and this person felt that they may be beamed up like cattle, their creativity extracted and then dumped as non-creative carcasses. But also, you can see that this is where they could get their accolades for their work as well. Another feared being boxed in, but rather wanted to feel that they were working in a creative community. But this person represented their great experience of interning as the crown on their education and a representation of industry as a constellation of disparate stars, and this person really looking forward to voyaging between them. But the richest ground is where we talked about the relationship between industry and education. Education had often been placed prominently, either by its size or shape, dominating the sheet. And in this case, it was visualized like an exploding star reaching into industry. Education absolutely central but inferring education was out there as well. Here, education squarely in the middle, but with a series of thick lines spiraling off. And those lines were this person's distinct periods in their profession. Remember, they're projecting ahead here. And the gaps were purposeful. And that same 
industry has been all around this. Education for it was entirely within it. And this one has industries, many functional bubbles. You see them around the outside there. And again, they're all around education. And education is a pie chart right in the middle. But the lower segment, it doesn't stop at the edge of the pie chart. It carries on into their chosen industry, print and editorial. And this theme of hops and passing through is even more explicit here. This person talks about the visual industry water wheel. People providing energy to turn the wheel from the lathe at the top of the mill, but then just passing on downstream. And here, industry visualized like a series of logs flowing down a stream. Like the old game Frogger, if anyone remembers it. The person, you jump from log to log as each log is swept downstream at different speeds. And that was their vision of what's to come. So the related things, themes that we're talking about here are expectation of education beyond the institution coupled with a willingness to move along. So where's that come from? Where's this expectation of education beyond the institution come from? Well, in creative education, we talk an awful lot about both creativity and employability. So we ask you to draw creativity on the way in. So let's hear a few of those, Alex. Can you describe what you've um, drawn? <laughs> uh, a tree with a, with a sun and some birds and a happy sort of hillside scene. OK, yeah. What have you drawn? Um, it starts as a spiral, coming from a very small point and then <laughs> spiraling out and then changing direction completely. OK, yeah, yeah. Mine is a exploding star. Right. Yeah. A tree, a spiral, changing direction completely, an exploding star. Yeah. And Gottfried Wagner describes the difficulty of working with creativity in saying that it's a kind of beloved non-word. It's an almost messianic formulation. One of those public screens onto which everyone can project everything. Well, I think that's the same of employability too. The institution loves this as a term, you know, top 10 for employability in the UK. But what does it mean? Well, <laughs> we ask you to, the most significant, significant element of employability for you. So let's say some of those. What did you write for employability? Uh, positive attitude and trustworthiness. Okay, three words. Trust and attitude. Uh, I did a little kind of, it's meant to be a spark for employability, spark. like some sort of quality. Is that a spark energy, yeah? What did you write for employability? Oh, I wrote freedom. Freedom, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, one dominant definition in the UK reads, a set of achievements, skills, understandings, and personal attributes that make graduates more likely to gain employment and be successful in their chosen occupations. But there's another dominant UK definition that appears somewhat to contradict that, and it touches on some of what you said. Employability, employability is not just about getting a job. It's about learning, and the emphasis is less on employ and more on ability, developing critical, reflective abilities. So, the first definition, the nub of it, employment and success in occupation. And what came out from the students is it matched entirely their focus uh, on employment and success in their occupation. And that was shown by this vagueness of wider life goals in relation to the specificity of their professional goals. The nub of the other definition, learning, less employ, more ability. It also seems to match somewhat what students said but it appears that students don't hold with this division between employ and ability. They want both. And what they seem to have done is come up with a mashup. And it's a very logical mashup of definitions. They want success in their occupation, but also education beyond the institution. That it's the backdrop to it is their employability. It is their employment. Now, we've clearly seen reflective abilities demonstrated by students in this research. The problem is that research causes people, yes, to wonder about their practice and their making, but it also 
makes them think about how they fit in, what they want, and how to get it. So it's challenging for the creative industries, yeah? Or maybe, because what's a potential outcome if these expectations aren't met for students? What if today's students find that this expected education isn't out there? But it's also great news for creative industries, because we're aware of the dangers of stasis for innovative creative organisations. Aaron Dignan, he advises global brands on how to become responsive. And he says, today's most trusted and important institutions are struggling to stay relevant. It's as if they were wired for a completely different environment. And he talks about the responsive OS, organizations who have a way of operating which is responsive and so are successful and growing. And one of the core values of that is learning versus sustaining. Sustaining, being risk averse and attempting only to protect what you've already got. But learning, it's about taking risks, potentially failing, but failing fast through the learning. So people who want to learn, who are inquiring, are good for the future of the organization. That can hold on to them. So what happens when some people, when people want to learn and move around to do so? Well, we left my story when I was around the same age as many of these students of the study. With a house and a car, which we've now heard, appeared to indicate success. And that suggests that I could have put my feet up, as we saw earlier, uh, safe under my own roof, um, but I didn't. After graduation, I coded for the original Nintendo computer game carts. I was a police officer and police trainer and an IT and comms manager. Then my own company, combining computing training presentation skills, I spent a lot of time in the UK in offices, training rooms, hospitals, but also South Sudan, former Yugoslavia, South Africa, and Khartoum. And along the way, during those two decades, I got a few more pieces of paper. But I've returned to higher education four more times to do that. To contort Steve Jobs' words, this is how I feel. I was lucky. I found out what I wanted to do later in life. By living the dots and connecting them backwards. Because the problem in a work role with reaching a dead end is that actually each person's life has only got one real dead end. Even what some of the students described as dead ends from the other direction are simply dots to connect later. Because when someone reaches that point, they just have to move on or wither. These students are saying what they want is to learn, but they will move on to do it. But they're not saying that they want to move on, nor that they have to. But they do expect education beyond the institution. So I brought here some of the emerging themes from students about to begin in the creative industries. But Peter Drucker said that one begins not with answers, but with questions. So I'm going to leave you with two questions. What if... Today's students didn't need to hop companies and industries to continue the education they expect. And what if today's students didn't even need to return to the academic institution to continue the education they expect? How could we make that happen? Thanks, Ian. Thanks for sharing your research with us. So you left us with a question. Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I'd just be curious because from my experience, I think from hopping from one place to another to another, um, it actually helps me grow instead of just becoming institutionalized into that one space. So I'll fire back with another question in that do you not think that sort of gaining different experiences like helps you grow instead of just having this sort of one kind of insular place where you're based? I don't know. Take that from what you will. Yeah. Don't know. <laughs> Didn't ask them that. Um, but um, my intuition is it doesn't need to be uh, linked. Having great experiences, developing and moving from one place to another, necessarily. You see it as that now, and I wonder where have you got that 
narrative that you need to move on to have those. Well, what do you think? Does it reckon, does it, um, uh, does it accord with your own experiences? Did you expect any learning when you left the academic institution? I had a slightly different question. Can I ask okay, it? Yeah. So the way we think about education is in temporal dimension, very much demarcated that you, you go to school, then you go to college for intensive period, you know, one year, two years, three years, four years, you stop and that's it. And the temporal and the institutional boundaries around higher education are quite impervious and there's a, perhaps a potential to break those barriers down both temporally and institutionally during the educational process so that it can be more interspersed with work in the world and the authority of the educational institution maybe needs to be a little bit more distributed in some ways. Yeah. Great, great point. <laughs> totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. So what are people's experiences? Who, who did, did design school? There you go. Cool. Does, does it accord with your experiences? Thank you. Um, yeah, it does. I think, um, you know, you're at design school and you're learning and you're, you're free, but you don't even really realise that you are until you get spat out at the other end and suddenly you've got to get a job. Um, and in my situation, I was quite lucky. I, I did get one straight away, but then when I came back, it was abroad, and when I came back here, it was very hard to find something that, that I could, um, well, t yeah, to, to be employed. So I ended up a bit like you, going off and doing something completely different because you have this immense pressure to be able to live and earn money, and suddenly you realise that you're not doing what you love anymore, and you're not creative, and you are trapped, and the only way to sort of get back into being... Um, free with that, I suppose. You feel like you have to go back into a learning environment rather than being able to learn uh, sort of as you go, if you like. Um, but I think now as well, with, with the fees that have you know, been introduced since I was at college, it's increasingly hard to then go back and do that. So, yeah, trying to kind of keep a lifestyle going and learn and be creative. And I mean, I think I've getting to that point now, 15 years later, <laughs> where I'm managing to do that, but it's taken, it's been very hard, and yeah, so I would agree with what you're saying, that it's, it, there is a sort of cut-off point with the learning when you leave uh, design school, definitely. Thank you. Do you have something? I suppose my experience is very, very different. I didn't go to a design school, yeah. um, so I went to university and, and, and had an education, and I have probably learned 10 times more since I left through hopping companies and the people I've worked with and the projects I've worked on than I ever did at college. The yeah. stuff I learned at college was very sterile. It had no, no practical <laughs> implementation at all. Yeah. So I suppose uh, in answer to your questions, it depends very much in what, what it is you're doing. My experience was, was very much that actually I don't think I need to necessarily go back to college to learn those things. Yeah. I learned it through through work and through constantly hopping around yeah. to extract. It's it's the people that I worked with yeah. more than the place the the, the the institutions I went to yeah. that, that actually built that learning. Yeah. So so you benefited from that. What's your feeling about the companies along the way that you hopped in and out of? What was their benefit? <laughs> benefit to them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, they, they did very, they did, they did very well out of me. Um, <laughs> some better than others, uh, and, and a lot of those com some companies you leave because the, the you and they go different ways, and because the projects finish, and, and uh, yeah, it's yeah. I suppose I probably did better out of it than they did, if I'm brutally honest. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks. I, uh, I went to three art colleges um, oh. from 1979 to 1982, none of the ones on there. And I've been a 
practicing graphic designer, furniture designer, bicycle courier, um, art mover. Um, and um, I'm kind of joining the, back, the, the dots backwards now and thinking about, about that. And uh, I um, kind of found myself maybe about 10 years ago thinking, I keep doing the same designs. I'm pulling from the same pool somehow. And I was kind of feeling frustrated by that. And it felt like I needed to stop kind of dealing with clients and go away on my own and somehow come back. That was the sort of model I had in my mind. And I met a friend um, who was a biology teacher. And he said that he, he um, had uh, gone on a course as a biology teacher where they said, you are teaching uh, how to draw the eye and how to draw a pig's intestines. Um, here's a shark, here's a pig, here's a rat, here's a rabbit, let's cut them up. And he said, after he came back, he never drew another <laughs> eye. And he just gave the kids animals <laughs> and flowers and plants. And they, they, he said the first thing they had was a shark from the butchers. And they opened it up and it was full of baby sharks. And he said, you know, from then on, he never kind of went back. And I kind of think, I want that sort of <laughs> experience again. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, what it made me do, actually, was say, I, I'm not going to be at the front of, I'm not going to be the lead creative in an organization anymore. I'm going to become a manager and make things happen. I'm going to get the best designers I can, and I'm going to carry on working, but I'm not going to be at the front edge. I kind of feel like I've sort of, I'm not current enough in my thinking. Uh, and so I kind of, and I've been in the same institution now for seven or eight years as a, as a book designer, web designer, exhibition designer. And I do feel that I, I would have liked to have somehow within that institution or within going back to college or whatever to somehow rejuvenate and got back to the excitement mm -hmm. and the energy that I felt when I, when I left college. Mm -hmm. So is there a different role for um, for college, for, for the art college, for the art and design college, is there a different role in, in those terms, in rejuvenating? I think so. Um, I suppose, in a way, I've, I've done it myself to some degree, but it kind of feels quite separate. Like, I kind of started painting again, yeah. but it, does, it, feels, it, does, it feels like that's kind of di in spite of or despite yeah. my, my, my professional work. Um, I'm not quite sure what it is. It's something like that biology teacher kind of going and just seeing people, hearing people, getting ideas. And, and that's quite a struggle within, within an institution. It's not valued very strongly to, to, to go to this sort of event yeah. uh, and, and hear people who aren't necessarily in, directly in your, in your line of work. Yeah. Um, the continuous professional development tends to be much narrower in his yeah. thinking. And that, that's a good point really, isn't it? That um, it, coming to this event, it's kind of a self-selecting audience as well. It's people that kind of are intrigued, will turn up at half eight after um, what I now learn is a, a, a weather bomb. Um, <laughs> never, never heard the term before. But, um, but, but yeah, so, so we are kind of a select few here as well. Thank you. Oh, one more question. Oh, two. Hold on. It's not so much a question as an observation, is because when I went to university, it was more of a sort of broad multimedia sort of degree, and I found that, in my experience, what I was taught was a lot of technicalities that by the time I graduated were out of date and didn't apply anymore anyway. And I've learned far more, like as someone else said, since I started working. And I found that even for me, even when I was in high school, the problem I always struggled with in the way I think and work was I tended to be given information rather than taught the skills to learn myself, and that's what I would say. Was lacking generally is we, we're not taught how to develop, how to learn, we're taught how to store information. Because I was never happy with what I learned in school, it wasn't what I wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. But that was what I was told I had to learn just for the sake of passing exams. To the point I ended up with a qualification, but what I learned in that qualification was useless to me by the time I had it. Yeah, and that, and that was my, my experience that in the first, uh, <laughs> the first two, going back to higher education, but the second one, when I went to um, Edinburgh Napier um, <laughs> with Scott there, um, was a totally different experience. It was about learning, it was about exploring, and then um, to Edinburgh College of Art. And, and that was the same. 
and that, um, that, that did capture me before I'd, I'd shut the door on it. Thanks. Okay, one, one more question, then we're going to have to wrap up. So do, do you think there should be a better connection between institutions, academic institutions, and employers? Um, because, I mean, I, I've worked for an advertising agency, and um, increasingly, partly because of the kind of the fast pace of the digital design and digital world, that the, uh, there's a kind of a lag, a disconnect between the grads that we're looking for and what we're actually doing. So I kind of I really liked what you're talking about, the kind of responsive organization, but I kind of feel that, that companies, agencies can move a bit faster <coughs> than, uh, than academic institutions. So is the answer to kind of connect them better? Yeah, it sounds a great idea, yeah. And that's, that's, that's really my question. I don't expect us to answer this, how we can do it here. But to take that question away, how, how should we go about building that um, handoff in, in a sense, and understanding from each other exactly what we want. Edinburgh College Art, we run something they call a design agency project, where mentors from industry do come in and they run their own agencies cross year, um, and it, it, it's been um, awarded by the Guardian University Awards um, last year. Um, and it's something where, uh, that's constantly commented on from the students that that was part of the most useful part of what they've got as well. Okay, let's exchange emails. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. Or even shake hands. Yeah, right. cheers. Well, thanks Ian again for an amazing talk. I hope everyone took something from that, how we can continue our own learning, even in our agency work, our own professional lives. Um, we're kind of tight for time, so if you do have more questions, just post them on Twitter with the hash, um, either to Creative Mornings Edinburgh or with the hashtag CM Eddie, and uh, we'll get those questions answered. Um, we still have the space for another half hour, so grab yourself more coffee. There's still so much food. Um, and thanks so much for coming. Um, let's give Ian another round of applause. Thanks.